Yeah, my name is Ray Lewis, 24 years career, Philadelphia Police Department, retired as a captain, and I moved up to upstate New York, Catskill Mountain region, and I lived a somewhat wilderness lifestyle for eight years. Uh, 25 foot square garden, organic garden, uh, goats, chickens, and uh, harvested my own wood with a, a large piece of property, heated at home with wood through a catalytic combustor stove, very energy efficient, very low polluting, and uh, for eight years, that was my life, and I loved it. And then I heard about this thing called the Occupy Movement, and I thought, whoa, what, what, all mainstream media was telling me is that they were yelling and screaming, they were dirty people, they wanted handouts, they, they refused to work. And I said, whoa, 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 common sense tells you that people, hundreds of people do not gather out there, sleep in that weather, in tarps and whatnot, just to yell and scream. No. So to find the truth, where do I go? I went to the internet, and I went to independent media. There I found out, and it's funny, that the, the, the one uh, blog I went to was appropriately termed crooks and liars, totally about politicians and uh, the rest of the crooks in government. And they had the Occupy Movement coverage, and they also had why they were there. They had a link to go to the declaration of the occupation. When I went there, I saw the declaration had 23 bullet points. All of them were against corporate greed and corruption, government corruption, and one of the big things was global warming, that we have to stop these corporations from destroying our Earth all for their greed. After I read those 23 bullet points, and as I was going down, I thought, wow, I agree with that one. I agree with this one. I agree. Every single bullet point I agreed with totally. I say, they are right. I have to do something. And the clincher was, I had this uniform. I realized by going down to Sukkoti Park that the mainstream media could not call me dirty. They could not tell me to take a bath. They could not tell me to get a job. They could not tell me I just wanted a handout. All right, so I could give some credibility to that Occupy movement. And boy, was I hit with two words when I was down there. They were so thankful, they constantly used two words. Captain, thank you, you've given us credibility and legitimacy. But when they said that, I always cringed. No, I don't give you that. I'm down here because you are credible. You are legitimate. So anyway, I, I made, pla I, man, Manhattan's an expensive place to live. And uh, having to look good, I could not sleep out every night. So I rented a cheap hotel in Harlem, but that still was uh, 80, $85 a night. So I thought I'd commit myself financially, energy, and resources to one month protesting at uh, Zuccotti. Well, that ended up being almost a year at Zuccotti. And since then, I've been out to Ferguson, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Indianapolis for gay rights to repeal the hatred of discriminating against gays. So my life has been nothing but activism since retiring. Okay, on this climate change, there are 95% of climate scientists all agree that the motion of climate warming is advancing, and it's advancing at a rapid pace, and it's exponentially increasing. And out of this 95%, five, obviously 5% five say, no, it's no problem. This is just naturally occurring, and we still have cold winters. Cold winters are proof that there's no uh, climate warming. But if you do a little bit of investigation and go behind the public, uh, the uh, puppet organizations that fund these 5% of scientists, you'll find out that these puppet organizations are funded by fossil fuel industry. And that's why they come out with these reports saying there's no problem. I'm not a gambler. I, I've never been to a casino. Uh, I don't like the environment. Uh, but the, the thing, the most important thing is, 
I refuse to invest my money in any type of game where the odds are against me. It makes no sense. Uh, and here, the odds are 95% against us believing that there's no problem. It's analogous to would you take your money to a financial advisor, invest it, and he says, okay, I'm going to put your money in a fund, but there's a 95% chance you're going to go broke. You're not going to do it. It's just common sense. We have the science on our side. These scientific reports, by the way, have been peer approved. Before these reports can be published in journals, they have to be put forth to other scientists on a board who look at the evidence, who look at the investigation, and say, yeah, this is valid. Now, out of that 95%, unfortunately, some of them believe we're past that tipping point. It's too late. Let me tell you about the a tipping point. The tipping point is when a situation gets so bad that that global warming is so much in motion that even if hypothetically you could stop all pollution, all use of oil, coal, and gas for that at that time, it wouldn't make a difference. That global process is already going on. And it's analogous to someone who goes to a doctor and they're told they have cirrhosis of the liver from heavy drinking all their life. And the patient says, okay, doc, I promise right today I will never have a drink again. Doctor will tell me it's too late. That process of the disease in your liver is going to continue whether you drink again or not. That's what's going on in our climate. And we're talking about our grandchildren, children. I don't have any, I'm not a father to any children, but I feel like an uncle to all the children because this is going to affect them, all right? Maybe it's not going to affect, but them, it's going to be a horror. Now, I love the way the, the gas company calls it a, a transition to renewable energy, and they use the term natural gas. Whenever I hear somebody try to sugarcoat something or gild the lily, I automatically feel they're trying to manipulate me. It's gas. It's not natural oil. It's not natural coal. Why is it natural gas? You can have natural yogurt, you can have natural peanut butter, but you don't have natural gas. It's toxic. What are they going to do? What, what are they going to call it next? Organic gas? <laughs> but they do make one point I have to agree with. That point is this. Gas does emit a lot less carbon dioxide into the air. Coal, oil, wow carbon dioxide big time, gas no. So they're right on that, and you'll hear that, and you can agree with them. What they don't tell you is that gas emits so much more methane than the oil or coal. Gas is terrible, and it's an emittance of, of methane, and here's the thing about methane. Even more so than carbon dioxide, methane has a heat holding capacity 80 some time 80 percent more than carbon dioxide so although there's less of it there's a whole bigger holding capacity for heat and therefore it's just as detrimental some people say more than the carbon dioxide now where does this gas come how do we get this gas out of the ground we know it's polluting once it's out of the ground we know it's polluting as it's burning well, guess what? It's also polluting as we get it out of the ground. Cuomo did not ban, Germany did not ban, Austria did not ban, Vermont did not ban fracking due to the effect after it was burned. They banned it due to the effect of the environment, the water, the land, uh, the air, when it was extracted. I'm not going to go into the details of the process of extracting gas. I just have to tell you one thing about that. Because once I tell you this one thing about the process of fracking, you will never need to know anything else. Here's that one thing. While Dick Cheney was vice president under George W. Bush, 
he held a secret energy meeting. And in this meeting, he had all the bigwigs, his former Halliburton, Exxon, you name it. Out of that meeting, he got George W. Bush to sign an executive order that banned, that, I'm sorry, not banned, that made the process of fracking exempt, the process of fracking exempt from the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Safe Drinking Water Act. What a despicable human being to get past, to pass something like that, that he knew would not pass the requirements of those three acts. But he did it. All right, now, what can we do about it? That's the question now. There's no doubt about the detrimental effect it has anymore. The only people that still believe it's safe are the, the equivalent of flat earthers. You're not going to get through to them. But what we can do about it, I'm going to divide it up into three things. Number one, we have to educate. Education is always the most important thing, whether it's race relations or gay rights or the environment. Education. We've got to get rid of the ignorance, the stupidity. First thing you want to educate is yourself. You have got to educate yourself so you can intelligently talk about it to others. Because in, in dealing with this and being part of this movement, you're going to get a lot of questions. You're also going to have pro-polluters in your audiences. And they're going to try to throw you some real ringers of questions to make you look like you don't know what you're talking about in front of crowds. So educate yourself as to the process of global warming. And also, though, go on the enemy's websites the fracking, the gas company, the oil burning, the fossil fuel company. See what they're saying, why it's not a problem. Because you're going to hear that from people in your crowd. And if you know those questions beforehand, you'll be able to answer them much more competently. So educate yourself. The, uh, oh, the, here, here's another thing about educate, after educating yourself, you want to educate the public. Back up in upstate New York, we fought ferociously during a recent election to get two Republican pro-frackers voted off of the town board. We replaced them with two Democratic anti-frackers. So, we, and the way we did that, we, we informed the public. We educated the public. One of the, we wrote many, many letters to the editor. Don't ever underestimate the impact a letter to the editor can have. I cannot tell you how many people got back to us saying, wow, I read that letter from so-and-so, I read that letter from so-and-so. Those letters do get read. The other thing we did that was successful, and this applies to global warming, in fact, we did, well, we did this about fracking. We, you can very easily download a lot of these environmental document, uh, documentaries from your laptop. All you need is a projector and a, a screen or a white wall. And we were very successful in getting local library to allow us to present uh, these do the documentaries on global warming. We were successful in a civic center, town hall, go to these different public places. And if you get turned down, as an individual, go back with three or four. We entered the editor's office, the, I'm sorry, the owner's office, the lobby, the lobby of the owner's office of our local paper because we did not feel he was giving appropriate coverage to the anti-frackers. Fifteen of us were in the lobby. His secretary had to call him saying, there's 15 people I want to talk to you. But well, we sat down with him. By the way, I was the only one thrown out of that meeting. Uh, he did not like my uh, vocalization. But anyway, the 14 remained, and next thing you know, the next edition of that paper came out much more positive about the anti-fracking candidate. So don't take it upon yourself. So, and, and a lot of times, now how do you advertise for something like this? Advertising obviously is key. Any business knows advertising is necessary. Don't uh, forget that local radio stations and your local newspapers often have uh, public 
announcements, a community announcements that are for free, and they will broadcast this meeting over their radio station, only a short, maybe 15 or 30 second clip. Newspaper will put a little ad in, use the media to advertise. Now, of course, social media always. The last, thir the third way of teaching people and educating people is through protests. I go to as many as I can because I know by going, I can, I hope to get, I know the strategy of mainstream media. Mainstream media, it's the filthy rich. They're synonymous. They want things just as they are because they're in power, they're in control, they're super wealthy, they have it made. They don't want any changes. So any demonstration is always about change. Mainstream media, filthy rich, they don't want to let white America, and I say white America because white America controls what goes on in this country. Little do they know that they're nothing but puppets for mainstream, uh, for uh, the filthy rich. And they're puppets because the media, the mainstream media has propagandized them to believe everything the filthy rich want. So, you want to educate mainstream America. And the way you do that is protesting in the streets and have signs. I'm such in favor of signs, signs, signs. Too often I heard people go past the demonstration and one asks the other, what were they protesting about? And the other person goes, no, I don't know. There were no signs. You have to have signs so a person driving by, they can see, whoa, mobilization on climate. Oh, uh, climate, there's a climate. Uh, vote Green Party, change the world climate. People, re and that puts it in their head. And even if it's not subconsciously thought of, every sign they see gets registered in the subconscious mind. And it's there, and it'll pick up on things in the future, talking about climate change. And it will also inspire people and make them curious. Whoa, why are all these people out here about climate change? Let me, so the next time they see an article on it, they might be more apt to read it. And little by little, you're planting the seed. Protests are planting the seed. What happens to the seed of an acorn? Oak tree will grow that big, baby. So you are planting acorns for global mobilization. The last thing I want to talk about is a more extreme way of protesting, and that's civil disobedience. You cannot, you cannot get charged with committing civil disobedience. There's no such charge. Okay, a lot of people don't understand that. That's a civilian term. And when you do commit civil disobedience and you get arrested, it's for disobeying a police order, blocking uh, pedestrian or vehicular traffic, or causing a disturbance. They are the things you'll get charged for. Now, all of them are summary. All of them will be released in a number of hours after the paperwork is done. And also that will get expunged from your record. Don't think committing civil disobedience is going to brand you for life. But even if you do think it will brand you for life, this is an issue that's important enough to be branded for life. <laughs> Lastly, I will tell you how inspiring civil disobedience is. When I got down to Sakati, sure, and I was there just like everybody else, uh, protesting with a sign. My sign is buried, was buried, but one of my signs, by the way, is watch Inside Job documentary about the financial collapse of two, 2008. But one day a fellow came up to me and said, Captain, will you help us and attend the demonstration on Thursday, November 17th to shut down Wall Street? I said, I'm down here. You use me any way you want. Thursday morning I'm there with my sign and I had no concept in my mind of committing civil disobedience. I, I, that idea of getting arrested never even entered my mind. I didn't have to make a decision. Well, let's see, do I, should I get arrested today? Should I commit civil disobedience? I don't know. Uh, let me see the pros and cons. The thought never entered my mind. I, I, 24 years of my career was for the law, not breaking the law. Uh, so I never thought of that. But while standing there with the sign, I saw numerous young people, one after the other, after the other, several hundred 
all being dragged away with those plastic uh, cuffs on. And I realized two things. One, they have no idea what's going to happen to them once they get taken out of the cameras. Three days before November 17th, the Ducati was brutally uh, destroyed. When you, dis uh, you brutally destroy a park like that, and then three days later, you're gonna get arrested by the same police. Damn, you're taking a chance on your welfare. They were willing to do it. For what? For justice, for those 23 bullet points. The second thing that hit me about all those young people getting arrested by civil disobedience was this. They did not know how long they were gonna be held. Were they going to lose their freedom for a day, a week, a month? They didn't know. But why were they willing to risk their unknown days of imprisonment or justice? Back to those 23 bullet points of the Declaration of the Occupation. And here, here's the kicker. When I saw them all going by in handcuffs and I realized that those two things, they were sacrificing their welfare, sac sacrificing their freedom, that so inspired me so much that I made the most spontaneous decision of my life. And I'm not a spontaneous guy, all right? I'm a planner. I plan everything, it came in handy in my career, but uh, that day I made the most spontaneous decision of my life. I put down my sign, I went out there, I sat down, I blocked pedestrian and vehicular traffic, and I was arrested for civil disobedience. Alrighty, last, I want to thank everybody for coming here, and don't forget to educate, vote, and protest like your life depended on it. Thank you.